So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the title of my presentation. It's uh, about investigating the relationship which exists between airlines, airports, and also with respect to uh, destination authorities. So, uh, just to give you an outline of what I'm going to do today, I'll start with uh, some uh, background story, which uh, is essentially related to how I decided to uh, uh, focus on this uh, particular area of research. Then I will highlight the relationship that exists between uh, transport and tourism, and then move into the heart of my lecture, which is about in turn a business triangle. Define it and then show how it's related to uh, aviation and tourism, also with uh, respect to what I call the risk quartet. Then uh, we will uh, get into specifics. We will talk about revenue and cost mapping in aviation because if you are to collaborate with others, you need to know them. Huh? So doing your uh, homework is quite important here. We're going to raise issues of dependency and also some elements of uh, transaction cost theory. Also, uh, you know, the practical elements, the policy implications of all these are quite important and they will be further highlighted in the uh, summary and conclusions of this lecture. So before getting into this graph, which uh, looks uh, like 20th century art, uh, it's not actually a uh, it's not coming from, from a gallery, it's very much related to how I decided to become involved uh, in uh, the area of tourism and aviation. So when I was doing my MPhil uh, in Oxford, I had this idea about doing my master's thesis on infant industries. And I don't know if you are familiar with the term, but this is related to uh, emerging industries that have a, a very big potential, but they somehow uh, need to be given a big push. So that's the case for the semiconductor industry, for example. So when I discuss this with my uh, personal tutor at Modeling College in Oxford, uh, Andrea Bolter told me, wonderful idea, but what do you know about infant industries? You don't have such things in Greece. And he was correct. So what he proposed to me is to deal with, with tourism, which, as he said rightly, it's a very, very important sector in our country. So I decided to uh, focus on tourism. My master's thesis was on the demand for international tourism in the Mediterranean region. But the whole idea behind the strategic growth theory and the big push theory was still in my mind. So what I decided to do uh, for my PhD thesis is to focus on the supply side and to uh, highlight, understand and develop models related to regional economic development in tourism and uh, air transport is obviously of great importance. Two of the things that I did in my DPhil thesis was to, uh, first of all, to develop a model regarding how tourism flows evolve in the short run. So uh, I develop a model which is related to origins. So here we have, for example, a group of origins and here we have a group of uh, destinations. Uh, I made this uh, classification into core destinations, big resorts, uh, like uh, Benidorm, for example, and peripheral resorts, which are everywhere. And also another classification is related to sun loose destinations, the typical sea and sun resort that many people enjoy, uh, but also wonder loose resorts, which are related to cultural tourism. So I developed a model to show all these uh, interactions that exist in space, but also with respect to markets, because uh, the big uh, uh, engine here, here uh, is you know, large companies, large transnational corporations that might exist in aviation, might exist in hotel industry or tour operators. So I developed a model for the short run. Subsequently, I developed a model for the long run. And I suppose that uh, many of you who are in business studies are familiar with the product life cycle. Uh, which is quite a well-known model, but from a practical perspective, it doesn't say much. All it says is that you start from uh, uh, scratch and eventually go uh, through development, uh, maturity, and possibly decline. So what I decided to do is to develop a, a model which embeds the product life cycle, but also studies abrupt changes in uh, uh, special configurations. In plain words, in addition to having uh, resorts that uh, you know, uh, gain uh, popularity and eventually mature and decline, you may get instant resorts. 
like uh, the case of Cancun back in the early 1970s. Or you might get resorts that did manage to succeed at some stage and then there was a tsunami or there was a political intervention or another reason that led to uh, decline. Now the big engine power behind uh, abrupt changes in the 80s, in the 90s, was uh, uh, the whole uh, power around tour operators. And until today, tour operators are very, very important. Uh, the market is uh, relatively concentrated. All-inclusive products uh, are back in fashion because they allow cost control. And for this reason, uh, tour operators do have uh, plenty of bargaining power uh, with respect to destinations. But increasingly, from mid-1990s onwards, things started changing. And so, uh, with the creation of the European Common Aviation Area, what we saw was the emergence of the low-cost carrier phenomenon. And I'm sure that you are familiar with uh, carriers like Ryanair, EasyJet, and many of them reshaped aviation geography in Europe and places that were completely unknown uh, were recently discovered uh, in, as a result of uh, uh, Ryanair getting into the airports or EasyJet or uh, other airlines as well. So from this perspective we can say that as a result of uh, you know, opening up the market in the mid-1990s, uh, in addition to tour operators that still play an important role until today, airlines are in a position to somehow, uh, if not dictate, at least to uh, uh, make uh, tourism flows either flourish or uh, uh, no, go down. So uh, airlines are quite important, but airlines are not on their own. Huh? We do need to consider infrastructure as well. So airports uh, increasingly do play an important role as well, also because uh, they have moved away from being typically regarded as public utilities to becoming something more of a commercial operation. So liberalization has uh, uh, gone across the entire spectrum of the supply chain in aviation, started with airlines moving into airports, which means that uh, we do have this interdependence between airlines and airports, but in the end, people don't fly for the sake of flying. They fly to go somewhere and do something. So unless we properly consider tourism destinations and put them into the frame, uh, it doesn't make much sense. So this is how the, the whole triangle develops in terms of airlines, airports and regional tourism authorities. We need to consider other actors as well in the, uh, uh, in the overall picture, but uh, uh, this uh, triangle is quite important. So talking about air transport and tourism, we can say that the demand for air transport is derived. People uh, fly in order to go somewhere, do something. This might be related to leisure tourism, might be related to business tourism. And aviation does have important effects on uh, 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 spatial development, on regional development. And economists make this distinction between direct indirect, induced and catalytic effects. So uh, uh, air transport can play an important role as a, a regional uh, engine, especially in developing economies, primarily in terms of tourism, also in terms of uh, cargo. And just to give you some statistics, about 52% of international travelers traveled by air in 2014. This is a rise of about 15% compared to what was the case in 1980. And employability is also quite important. Direct employment impact of uh, transport and tourism close to 15 million jobs. And if you also consider the indirect uh, induced and catalytic effects, we're close to 35 million jobs. So it seems that the two sectors are structurally interrelated. And uh, very recently, uh, we published a, <coughs> uh, a paper with uh, uh, Marine Ftimi, who is also here at WL, and uh, uh, Pablo Savanit is about showing this uh, interdependence that exists between destinations and some uh, uh, main air transport stakeholders. As you can see, here we name three, meaning airlines, airports, and air navigation service providers. They are those that control uh, traffic management, but primarily the relationship is among airlines, airports, and destinations. So as you can see, when we talk about destinations, we need to know the quantity of visitors, the quality of visitors, the overall ambience uh, that exists at a, <coughs> at a um, destination level, the destination atmosphere, 
we need to know things about accommodation, the available infrastructure, and likewise when we talk about airlines, we need to know the business model, the type of aircraft use, uh, whether you, they use yield management practices, the pricing strategy, network structure, where they fly, and again for airports we need to know uh, uh, what is the uh, airport infrastructure, we need to know the run number of runways, length of runways and so on. And again, when we talk about air navigation service providers, we need to know whether uh, you have the capacity to uh, uh, properly offer the services. And all these things are structurally interrelated. Obviously, I will not go through all the different arrows we have here, but it's uh, very easy to understand, for example, that you cannot really uh, develop uh, tourism unless you have an airport in an area. And it's not only about having an airport, it's a matter of how big the airport is in terms of number of runways or uh, in terms of length of runways. For example, Ryanair, uh, usually does not fly to airports that have runways shorter than 1500 meters. Huh? So if you really want to uh, get a low-cost carrier flying into your airport, you need to overcome this infrastructure constraint. If you are not in a position to do it, you can't rely uh, and you can't expect low-cost carriers to fly to your airport and you would have to identify other possible uh, uh, players to, to come and help you. So as you can see things are interrelated again depending on uh, for example whether you rely on charter carriers you may get uh, different types of uh, uh, travelers compared to other lines. Increasingly low-cost carriers do not cater only for leisure passengers they also cater for business passengers but in all cases this does have implications for the business model in terms of accommodation at a destination level. So all these different things uh, come together and there are a number of relations to, to identify. So coming now into uh, the main uh, area and uh, the, the, the core subject of my lecture which is about the eternal business triangle, I had to come up with a definition and uh, uh, this is how I define it. So it's a relationship evolving among three uh, business stakeholders, among whom there are interdependent conflicting and or competing attachments of a transactional nature. So we're talking about uh, business stakeholders who are in a, what we would call a love and hate relationship. Huh? It may be conflicting, but on the other hand, they need to do business with each other. Right? They need to understand the transactional nature of things. So ideally, what we would need to do is to identify a triple win relationship, something that would make everybody happy and not a win-lose, because such an outcome would not be acceptable and sustainable. So in our case, the three main uh, uh, players to identify is the airline, the airport and the tourist destination authorities, possibly in the context of a DMO. A DMO it is a destination management organization, or in other cases it may be uh, understood as a destination marketing organization. In any case, a DMO, where it exists, is expected to play a crucial role in coordinating the service suppliers at a destination level and ideally uh, deal with uh, the airline and the airport when uh, uh, you know, developing this relationship. So the objective of this uh, business triangle is to reach consensus in terms of a triple win business agreement. Now, as you understand, uh, you know, the reality is uh, far more complicated. So the objective is much easier set than achieved. And what I'm going to do now is to explain why in reality we face all these different types of problems. To do so, I will focus on the risk quartet. Huh? So we've done a bit of geometry here. We've talked about the triangle. Uh, now uh, I'm getting into other uh, shapes as well. So what are the four elements to consider here? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, white elephants. I don't know if you've heard the term before. I'm going to uh, explain in detail and how this is related to the so-called escalation of commitment. Then I'm going to talk about auctions and uh, winner's curse, the idea of free riding and how this is related co to coordination failure. And finally, the uh, idea of strategic partnerships, which in general 
it's uh, something very important, but don't put all your eggs into one basket because that may result in a high level of dependency with uh, very negative implications. So all these areas are quite important and what I'll try to show now is that our business triangle is essentially bruised uh, by the risk quartet. Huh? There are many elements of risk that need to be taken into consideration if we are to resolve uh, this uh, uh, conflictual situation. So starting with white elephants, huh? so that takes us to, to India uh, where uh, there seems to be a, a, a culture about uh, worshipping uh, white uh, elephants and white elephants do exist but uh, uh, they are quite rare and uh, you know, given the laws of demand and supply and because of their rarity they are regarded as uh, sacred animals. Having said that, if you really want to destroy uh, those that you dislike, the perfect gift that you can give them is a white elephant. And why is it so? Because it's a sacred animal, so you cannot ask the elephant to get in the production process. Uh, and on the other hand, as you know, elephants do consume a lot. Huh? They eat a lot. So that's the perfect recipe for financial bankruptcy, huh? because uh, you make uh, no profit out of the elephant, but you do need to uh, spend a lot in order to uh, feed them and so on. So metaphorically, when we speak about white elephants, we usually refer to grandiose pharaonic infrastructure uh, that has been built for a certain cause, but for some reason were unable to achieve the occupancy rates or the load factors or uh, what uh, actually this uh, infrastructure was built for. And uh, when we talk about aviation, uh, white elephants seem to be present. Huh? Concorde was a technological miracle, but uh, uh, it never uh, made much commercial sense. And when we talk about airports, uh, there are a number of airports around the world that are regarded as uh, white elephants. And when we talk about escalation of commitment, this shows actually the real problem of path dependence. You might have a very big uh, airport, like Mirabel Airport in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Montreal, typical case of uh, a white elephant in my opinion. And uh, you think that just because you have infrastructure, just automatically passengers will come there and airlines will come there, but if you now go to uh, Mirabel Airport, it never took off. And that's not only the only case, there are many cases around the world. So you can't really expect that infrastructure is uh, a sufficient and necessary condition uh, for tourism uh, to, uh, you know, flourish. You need many more things. But from an airport perspective, this is the main worry. Eh? Uh, they don't want to be stuck with infrastructure that has limited alternative use. They need to make good use of their infrastructure and they want to avoid just plunging more and more infrastructure, believing that uh, the very reason why passengers didn't come in the first place was that uh, there was something wrong with the infrastructure. And in many cases, actually, airports do commit this fundamental mistake. And so they do put a lot of effort into new infrastructure, which doesn't seem to uh, make the magic trick. And then they keep investing more and more, believing that the problem was not from a demand side, but uh, a problematic supply side. So that leads to escalation of commitment and to an inflationary uh, white elephant. So the big concern of airports is how to deal with infrastructure because the infrastructure is sunk. Huh? If uh, passengers don't like a place, an airline can easily redirect its aircraft elsewhere. On the other hand, you cannot put an airport into wheels and take it elsewhere. You cannot undo an airport. The airport is there to stay and all you can do uh, with an airport, at least from a commercial point of view, is to use it uh, for air operations. Second thing that we need to consider is auctions uh, and winner's curse, which uh, sounds a bit like an, an oxymoron, but uh, a winner's curse is uh, widely used as a term in game theory and auction theory to highlight cases where you may be a winner of an auction, but uh, then you realize that you've actually paid too much. So uh, that might be the case, for example, of uh, tourist destination authorities or airports uh, bidding in order to attract uh, uh, airlines and 
people in the sector are familiar with the Ryanair effect. So a number of uh, destination authorities or uh, airports may regard uh, Ryanair as a messiah, somebody that can uh, lure tourists to come in millions and bring a lot of money and prosperity. But, you know, if all different destinations and airports start thinking this way, uh, Ryanair or any other low-cost carrier has every commercial interest to start playing destinations and airports against each other. So that may result into what we call a zero-sum game, where it's uh, actually the uh, low-cost carrier that gains uh, all the money, or the benefit to the detriment of uh, uh, the airport or the destination authority. So you may end up having a destination finally managing to attract a low-cost carrier, but they may have given so much to them that it's like a curse and not a real benefit. So the big problem to consider here, again, is this lack of uh, coordination, how it's possible to, to win, let's say, a concession or to, to win accessibility as a result of low-cost carrier coming into your destination, but in the end you may have given a lot in terms of uh, indirect subsidies or in terms of uh, uh, other concessions offered. The third area of worry is related to uh, what we call in economics free riding and coordination failure. And this is a typical example of a tandem bike. So uh, uh, you have uh, nine people uh, here uh, who are riding a bike and uh, if they are well coordinated then obviously it's a success story. But you know many people might think that uh, this is going to be the case. Well, Possibly not, because if you imagine that one of these people may think, okay, we are nine, so why don't I just uh, relax, uh, sit back, pretend that I cycle, in reality do nothing, and just uh, enjoy myself, uh, expecting that the other eight are going to do the same. But if everybody keeps uh, thinking the same way, uh, then uh, in the end everybody will fall down because uh, there will be nobody there uh, to properly cycle. Huh? So this is what we call coordination failure and again typically it's uh, uh, an area of concern huh? because uh, we may say for example that airports should how somehow uh, collaborate vis-a-vis uh, -vis airlines so tourist destinations should have a code of conduct uh, when they decide to negotiate with airlines and airports but in reality, uh, there is always this incentive to cheat. Huh? So if we cannot surpass and deal with this coordination failure problem, uh, we may end up uh, suffering from free riding. And the fourth element that I would like to identify is dependency. So strategic partnerships, quite an important thing to consider. And people keep talking about PPPs, public-private partnerships, and how good they are about uh, building uh, a long-term relationship, which is right, but uh, on the other hand, uh, they may be prone to creating conditions of high levels of dependency, and I'm sure you all know the expression, don't put all your eggs into one basket. So imagine, for example, that uh, uh, you are a tourism authority, and together with the airport, uh, you signed a nice agreement uh, with uh, a low-cost carrier to come to your airport and bring millions of tourists. And initially you may be happy because that might be the case, but uh, uh, then suddenly something happens and the low-cost carrier goes bankrupt. And if that particular low-cost carrier uh, uh, accounted for 100% of your traffic, suddenly you go from uh, uh, heaven to, to hell. Obviously, you know, market forces will be there to take advantage of the situation and most probably uh, new airlines will come up, but you don't know how much time this will take and you don't know uh, whether they will use uh, uh, abusive terms uh, in order to take advantage of the situation. From, so from a strategic point of view, although partnerships are quite important, what an airport authority should do or what a tourist destination authority should do is to focus on many uh, different airlines. And that's actually the case for an airline. A portfolio strategy is quite important. If you just fly to a single destination and if for some reason this destination gets out of fashion or if there is a terrorist attack or something else, you need a plan B. Eh? You need to be in a position to redirect your aircraft. So strategic partnerships are important, but on the other hand, 
very high levels of dependency may also prove detrimental. So this quartet that we explained here may cause significant trouble in developing a triple win relationship for our eternal triangle. So is there a solution to this impasse? Well, if you talk to economists, usually in uh, welfare economics we make this scenario about uh, the existence of a benevolent social planner uh, that uh, uses uh, hundreds of very difficult equations using dynamic stochastic optimization theory, optimal control theory as we say, and the very idea of this benevolent social planner is to uh, maximize uh, the total uh, society's utility. And in that case, if you do have a, such a planner, you do ha get a happy ending, but unfortunately that's not the case. So we would have to consider uh, the second scenario, which is a decentralized outcome, meaning an outcome based on market forces, and increasingly all uh, different three uh, business stakeholders I mentioned are run uh, as commercial operations, or they coordinate uh, commercial operations as it is the case of a DMO. So the idea here is to be realistic, not expect uh, a social plan to come, but actually uh, get a decentralized outcome which is based on negotiations. Huh? And these negotiations have to be well informed, so uh, uh, the three business stakeholders should get to know each other and uh, this is also about rational trust building. It's not emotional trust building, it's rational. It means it makes commercial sense to trust the other two parties because uh, if you don't trust them, they won't trust you and because if you don't trust them, uh, you will end up losing money. So the idea is to devise an incentive mechanism that will be uh, mutually binding and will make sense for the parties to, to come together. So, uh, in terms of negotiations, it's very, very important to prepare effectively and the first thing that we need to do here is to know uh, ourselves but also to know the other business stakeholders. So what we need to do is to undertake a revenue and cost mapping analysis in order to highlight uh, what are the needs and wants of uh, uh, the other uh, uh, stakeholders. Huh? Because if you don't really know what the other stakeholder wants, how is it possible for you to negotiate with them and coin an agreement? So doing this analysis is quite important and at the second level what we need to do is to apply strategic management tools but also to uh, undertake a dependency analysis because remember it may prove too risky to put all your eggs uh, into one basket. What you need to do is to identify the uh, current, the prevailing, the potential competitive environment, also the role to be played by uh, the uh, three different stakeholders. And then you have to identify costs that go beyond <laughs> the market. Huh? So when we talk um, about uh, buying or selling services, there is always a price uh, to pay and uh, a cost related to that. But in addition, uh, to uh, market costs and prices, we have costs which are very much related to the nature of this transaction. And these are called transaction costs. Uh, there is a wide theory economics called TC, transaction cost economics, and it can help us a lot in order to reveal potential areas of risk. Huh? So uh, uncertainty, asset specificity, frequency, uh, quite important issues to consider. In many cases, they result in contractual agreements that remain incomplete. So what we need to do is to consider this effectively in order to uh, have a sustainable business relationship among airlines, airports and tourist destinations. So starting with the cost and revenue mapping and starting with airlines, first of all, we need to consider the different areas of cost. So usually when we talk about airlines, we make a distinction into operating costs and non-operating costs. Our emphasis here is on operating costs that depend on the level of uh, uh, production and we can make a further distinction into direct and indirect operating costs depending on uh, whether uh, they are aircraft specific or not. So when we talk about direct operating costs, as you can see uh, the two other business uh, uh, stakeholders are present, meaning the, oops, the airline needs to spend money 
uh, for the airport because they play, they pay airport charges. They also need to uh, uh, spend money for uh, navigation. This does not go uh, to the tourist destination authorities, but it is destination specific because depending on the country and the distance where you fly to, uh, you would be expected to incur different levels of navigation charges. So it's also distance related. It's related to uh, how much money you would be expected to pay for labor, uh, cabin crew, flight crew and fuel. Then we need to consider indirect operating costs, which may be again airport related like station and ground handling costs or destination related. So when you have an airline developing a new route, they need to spend money in terms of promoting this route, in terms of advertising, in terms of making people become aware of the existence of this route. So it's actually also about catchment area branding. And then you have third party related indirect operating costs. So money that you have to spend for sales, for example. And likewise, you have revenue where we can actually uh, make this distinction between fair revenue and ancillary revenue. So typically, uh, airlines uh, make money by selling tickets, as you know. This is volume related, so that depends on the number of passengers. But it's also destination and airport related. And so uh, uh, if you have a, a well-known uh, destination with a very uh, good brand name, in that case, the airline may be in a position to command a brand premium huh? and uh, uh, this may be imposed on passengers and they might be happy to pay for that simply because they acknowledge the importance of uh, the destinations. In any case, we need to consider uh, the uh, prevailing competitive conditions as well. Likewise, in terms of ancillary revenue, what we consider here is the uh, supply chain. So uh, an airline might make money by having uh, an alliance, a partnership with a, a local car rental company, which is uh, based at the airport. So in that case, it becomes an airport related ancillary revenue might be related to a destination. So uh, uh, and that's the case with uh, low cost carriers. In many cases, they do receive uh, uh, indirect subsidies in the form of advertising receipts. This is a very big issue and has very, very important legal connotations. Uh, there is a whole body of uh, literature regarding to state aid and whether uh, destination authorities are allowed to give subsidies, even in direct ones, in the form of advertising receipts. So we have to put an asterisk here because this is a very crucial issue. And then we have third party related. Huh? So uh, when you have a local scary, for example, selling food and beverage on board, this is uh, ancillary revenue to them. And likewise, we need to do the same exercise for airports. And so uh, in terms of cost, we need to identify aerodrome and terminal infrastructure costs. This may be related to airlines. So if airlines are in need of boarding bridges or of a baggage handling system, which is usually the case, the airport should be there to provide that. Obviously, they are remunerated for that, but we have to incur a cost. Uh, again, it may be passenger related huh? because passengers may need to use their cars, so we need to have a car park or shopping facilities. May be related to infrastructure outside the terminal, which uh, is usually third party related, and then we may have other costs as well. Huh? So the airport may also spend some money on developing a specific route. So that is destination related and you get uh, general admin overheads as well, which are third party related. Again, in terms of revenue, we usually classify revenue into aeronautical and non-aeronautical revenue. So aeronautical is very much related to the heart of operations, is related to passengers flying and the airlines flying these passengers. But then we have non-aeronautical revenue as well. So when you get into the duty free and do some shopping there, this is concessions inside the terminal. It's passenger related non-aeronautical terminal. Uh, when uh, you receive as an airport some uh, indirect subsidies or some other form of aid from uh, local authorities or public authorities, this is destination related non-aeronautical revenue. And again, you may receive concessions which are outside the terminal. So as you can see, for both airlines and airports, there are always third party elements in terms of both revenues and costs. But many of these elements are very much related to uh, the other stakeholders. So what is a cost for one stakeholder is a revenue for the other and vice versa. 
And finally, we need to consider uh, destinations. So destinations do need to spend money on the provision of public services. This may be for tourists, let's say an info point, or for airports in terms of providing public transport services to an airport or maybe third party related, maybe related to investment activities, especially if the destination authority decides to somehow get a, a shareholding in an airport or in a local airline, could be third party related as well. And then they need to spend money for promotion, eh? so for trade promotional costs, tourism and so on. So this may be related to uh, airports, to airlines and to third parties. And on the other hand, a, a tourist destination authority does expect to make some money as well. So obviously, as every country, as every authority, they do make money out of taxes. So tourists pay indirect taxes whenever you visit a hotel. Uh, you pay a hotel tax and this goes to the pockets of a local authority. May, may be related to airports. Airports do make money and they pay direct taxes on their income. They may be related to airlines if these airlines are locally based and obviously it may be related to third parties as well. And then we may have non-tax revenues primarily resulting as, uh, as uh, a result of having the uh, uh, local authority being involved as a, as a shareholder uh, in let's say an airport or an airline or in case they receive uh, uh, transfers from the central government. So this mapping I think is quite important because it identifies this structural relationship. But uh, you have revenues and costs for each of these three business stakeholders, but in many cases what is a cost for one is revenue for the other, which means that there is an area of complementarity, an area where negotiations can take place and possibly uh, uh, results to be taken. Now, I understand that the uh, text uh, was a bit heavy, so here we have a, a picture of a futuristic kind of airport, which seems to be very nice. I hope it's, uh, it's uh, uh, not a picture of, of, of a white elephant, but uh, again, remember what we said earlier about strategic partnerships and the whole idea of uh, uh, you know, building long-term relationships. And in theory, it sounds quite nice, but uh, we need to make sure that uh, we don't put all our eggs into one basket. So as an airport manager and from a strategic management point of view, what you need to do is to ensure that uh, uh, you follow a sort of portfolio analysis, meaning that you do not just depend on one market, and that you have a number of countries or a number of cities in terms of origins and destinations, that you don't rely on a single airline, and that you have a multitude of airlines, and that you don't get, for example, all your traffic during August, and for the rest of 11 months of the year, you're a ghost turbot. You don't want to do that. Ideally, you would like to reduce temporal seasonality. You would like to rely on as many airlines as possible. You would like to be served and serve uh, uh, different countries and different cities. So why would you need to do that? Basically, in order to uh, be in a position to uh, escape in case something goes wrong. Because if you put all your eggs into one basket and your key uh, partner goes bust, then it will be very difficult for you to sustain operations. And likewise, if you are an investor, you need to know uh, whether your uh, potential partner there has a high element of risk. So financing airport projects can be a risky uh, element as a result of all this sunk infrastructure. So knowing whether the level of dependency is high or not, again, is important. So as we say here, Measuring airport dependency can provide a useful benchmark for airports and it can give a very practical uh, kind of uh, element a view to the strategic uh, uh, partner there, to the airport manager, whether they are doing well or whether they should undertake further airports, further efforts to uh, uh, diversify uh, the portfolio and seek further commercial agreements. So in a paper that uh, we published a few months ago with uh, uh, colleagues from different countries of uh, the world. Uh, we uh, uh, examined the evolution of the ADI, which means the Airport Dependency Index, uh, for uh, a, a number of European airports, uh, uh, there were about 600 if I remember well. So here I just have a spider diagram for uh, some of the largest airports 
in Europe. So, uh, we, we, I mean, from a technical perspective, we use a relative Gini uh, coefficient. I'm not going to bother you with uh, 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 the technicalities, but this takes values from 0 uh, to 1. So if it's close to 1, it means that you have actually put all your eggs into one basket, and that's dangerous. Whereas if it's close to 0, it means uh, that you are doing quite well. You have a very diversified approach. And we uh, undertook this uh, study for a number of years, and here you see the evolution between 2005 and 2014. And uh, interestingly, uh, I mean, if we talk about uh, he London Heathrow Airport, as you can see, there hasn't been much change over the years. There's been a slight uh, reduction in terms of dependency, uh, but generally speaking, dependency is uh, not that high. So for London Heathrow Airport, for example, it's uh, close to uh, 0.4 or 0.5. Whereas if you talk about uh, this one, if you talk uh, about Oli Airport in Paris, for example, it's, it's, it's much higher. So uh, although, you know, uh, as you know, British Airways is uh, the main strategic partner of London Heathrow, London Heathrow is doing quite well. They have a, a very good commercial strategy and they somehow manage to keep the dependency at acceptable levels. And, and you know, this is very real challenge on the one hand, to have some big, uh, powerful airlines that uh, operate uh, using a hub-and-spoke network, uh, using your airport as a hub base, which is what British Airways is doing out of Heathrow. But on the other hand, to have uh, a clever commercial strategy and try to reduce your overall dependency as much as possible. And then we need to consider all these different costs that go beyond market costs. And the three elements that uh, have been identified here is asset specificity, uncertainty, and frequency. So when we talk about asset specificity, uh, we refer to elements that uh, are of specific value uh, to uh, the particular uh, stakeholders in question. So formally, as we say here, is the degree to which an asset can be redeployed to alternative uses and by alternative users without sacrificing any productive value. So it's very much related to the opportunity cost. So if you are an airline and you want to develop a new route, uh, you have to uh, uh, you know, develop a certain strategy there. And uh, this is site-specific. You may need to have people uh, doing some market research dedicated to that particular area, do some brand exercise. And, you know, all this is specific to the destination, meaning if the end the destination doesn't really sell, this is like a sunk cost for you. You've lost it forever. You cannot resell it to somebody else. And that's also the case for an airport. They may have some physical asset specificity. Take the example I mentioned earlier. If you want run in your airport, you need to have a lengthy runway. So you may decide to invest in a runway project, but you wouldn't do uh, uh, under other circumstances just uh, uh, to attract the low-cost carrier. So if, for example, you decide to fly to Israel or to uh, other countries where security issues are of importance, you may decide to have some dedicated assets in terms of security control. So again, if for some reason uh, this market doesn't pick up, uh, you are in trouble. And then from a destination perspective, they need to promote themselves, they need to uh, uh, have, let's say, a public service uh, 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 transport to the airport. All these may prove very specific and they do raise issues of concern in case something goes wrong. And this builds into the second element, which is about uncertainty. So this emerges as a result of uh, uh, changes in the nature of things. It might be force majeure or it might be something happening in the external environment which does affect the system as a whole. Huh? So when we talk about aviation, the big issue here is how to forecast traffic demand. Huh? Uh, you may have some certain projections, but for some reason they may turn to be wrong, huh? either in terms of overall numbers or in terms of seasonality, overall, overall nature. Again, it's a matter of investment. How much are you going to invest in terms of volume? Where are you going to invest? What is the cost of the overall infrastructural development? And again, remember all the basic risks associated with investment per Z. And adding uncertainty into the game makes the whole um, area much more complicated. Then it's also about maintenance, operation. It's about uh, the promotional marketing. 
uh, scale uh, that you need to consider for the destination and so on. So in addition to asset specificity, we need to consider uncertainty, we need to undertake all these uh, analysis related to pestel, to the political, economic, social, technological, environmental and legal area and all these uh, uh, different shocks that uh, may get into the system uh, result in uh, uh, further uh, uh, stochastic conditions. Then it's a matter of frequency. Huh? So uh, if you have a low cost carrier forming a base or if you have a, a network carrier operating a hub out, a, out of a specific airport, in that case frequency is quite high. Huh? And you would expect uh, the transactional nature of things that I mentioned earlier to be somehow streamlined. However, if you end up having only infrequent services, then Obviously, this uh, cannot uh, allow you to build trust uh, and uh, all the other elements that I mentioned earlier, meaning asset specificity and uncertainty will prevail. So essentially what we need to do here is to do this uh, different uh, analysis at different levels, consider uh, all this quartet of risks that uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, do a proper revenue and cost mapping, do a dependency analysis, identify and somehow quantify all the transaction costs. And uh, if we manage to do such analysis, at least in theory, we should be in a position to make some valid propositions uh, to uh, uh, business stakeholders. So coming now <laughs> towards the, the end of, of my lecture, I'm going to talk about the implications of all this analysis for the eternal business triangle that I mentioned earlier. Now what is at stake here is profit of welfare uh, maximization. Uh, that's a, a, a main principle of economics and remember it should be a triple win situation. All involved stakeholders should win, otherwise it will not uh, work. Uh, we said earlier that uh, this relationship uh, is a love and hate one. There are conflicting elements but on the other hand there are synergies. So we should somehow find an optimal path uh, in order to, to move forwards. So we need constructive uh, uh, negotiations, as we say here, uh, that will shape and set the fundamentals for an optimal relationship based, of course, on the bargaining power of each stakeholder. Obviously, if you have Rhino on the one hand and entirely little tourist destination on the other hand, you can't expect uh, them to be at the same level. Obviously, they have different uh, elements and different uh, 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 strengths in terms of the bargaining power. Having said that, at least everybody should be aware of uh, uh, the relative strength. So subject to legal constraints, and again, as I said, this is a big issue because the European Commission is increasingly getting unhappy about issues related to state aid, issues related to subsidies, even if this take place uh, through uh, indirect uh, advertising expenditure and not as proper subsidies, which in many cases are illegal. So subject to legal co constraints, uh, such a relationship, uh, meaning an optimal relationship among airlines, airports and tourist destination authorities, should take the shape of a long-term trilateral agreement, meaning all three stakeholders to be involved. And you should have also a marketing agreement, which should involve uh, structural changes also in airport charges, and I will explain this in the next slide and possibly the emergence of investment hostages. This is an interesting term and I suppose you all know what a hostage is. When we talk about investment hostages is essentially about having somebody uh, committing to an investment, not necessarily because the investment is going to make money, but as a signal that they're there to stay for a while. Huh? So at some stage, for example, Ryanair decided to uh, collaborate with Charleroi Airport in Brussels and uh, pay some money for infrastructure developments at the airport there. So the idea there was for the airline to commit into an area that traditionally they don't want to. Mm? Airlines want to be very flexible. They want to be able to redirect their flights uh, depending on different market conditions. But by committing to a certain level of investment at the local airport, what Ryan wanted to show was that 
they commit uh, to uh, 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 Brussels Charleroi Airport as a long-term partner. This is what we call uh, an investment hostage because to some extent you have a common future between the airline and the airport as is the case for example between uh, hostages and uh, uh, those that uh, 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 capture the, the hostages. In many cases, this may also lead to vertical governance. So vertical integration would be the case where an airline and airports uh, belong uh, to uh, the same owner. Vertical governance does not necessarily mean ownership. It is uh, a milder, let's say, a way of uh, coordinating uh, actions and uh, uh, business operations. So, uh, uh, in terms of how these things can work, and this is just very schematic, but it, it gives you an idea of how uh, we can move forward. Remember, uh, everybody wants to make money here, but everybody needs to uh, consider uh, the areas of concern. And the interesting thing is not to do this for themselves, but for the other business stakeholders to uh, consider this as well. So an airport wants to make money. This money might come from aeronautical revenue or non-aeronautical revenue. So as we say here, an airport may accept reduced aeronautical revenue if uh, they may receive a compensation in terms of uh, rising non-aeronautical revenue or if they have somebody, uh, meaning the other two stakeholders, the airline or the local destination authority, partly financing their infrastructure. Remember, the biggest worry for an airport is uh, uh, to become a white elephant and be in a position to do nothing with the sunk airport infrastructure. So if the airline or the tourist destination authority commit into airport investment, this does take some weight out of uh, uh, the equation for the airport and the airport may in return uh, accept to, uh, you know, uh, lower aeronautical revenue, meaning lower airport charges, lower passenger taxes, and so on. Likewise, low-cost carriers, as you know, in many cases, they don't actually make much money out of fares because they're quite low. They might make money out of ancillary revenue by selling all these different services, or they might make money through uh, indirect uh, 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 subsidies which may be in the form of advertising income. So a low-cost carrier may accept uh, low advertising income if somebody else does something for them. So if a local authority, for example, can commit to improving its brand name, if the airport uh, accepts to lower its airport charges, then from a cost perspective it's good news for a local carrier, which means that in return uh, they may accept reduced advertising income. Now the local authority has a clear incentive to uh, give money to improve its brand name huh? because after all that's good for uh, uh, the destination overall and likewise an airport might be happy to uh, uh, accept reduced charges if on the other hand the local carrier gives something to the airport in terms of an investment host hostage let's say uh, giving money for uh, airport infrastructure Likewise, remember, a local authority makes money out of taxes, and so they may accept some tax concessions, they may be in a position to provide other services to the airport, uh, to the local carrier, provided, of course, that they receive something in return. Now, what uh, the local authority would like to do is to reduce its overall promotional budget, and a clever uh, tourism uh, uh, policymaker would not like to be accused of favoritism. Huh? So if you just have one low-cost carrier and you give all the money to that low-cost carrier in the form of advertising income, uh, you may be accused of corruption, favoritism and so on. So you don't want that. So ideally, uh, if you manage to have this tripartite agreement and make sure that uh, your promotional budget is reduced as a result of being partly undertaken by the other two stakeholders, then things may prove uh, easier. So the idea here is to have a kind of uh, uh, mechanism, an incentive mechanism that can lead into a triple win situation because all different parties here uh, do have um, a clear incentive to uh, interact and uh, transact uh, with the others. So coming into my summary and conclusions, 
as we said, this uh, uh, triangle, this relationship among airlines, airports and tourist destination authorities may prove quite complex. What we need, of course, is to ensure that uh, a triple win situation emerges. Huh? What the three stakeholders need to do is to understand the structural interdependency, the common future, and uh, move accordingly. Now, of course, the big issue here is risk sharing primarily related to all these issues about infrastructure. It's also a matter of a time horizon, so uh, by definition an airport has a longer term strategy, whereas an airline might have a shorter term one, so we need to consider risk sharing and this is a natural area of conflict, but if you have skillful, enlightened uh, negotiators and if they work together to build trust, again, not on emotional terms but on rational terms, then I think we can make this uh, business relationship flourish and ideally, and just to use some business psychology here, evolve from a purely transactional into a relational and possibly into a transformational relationship uh, that will uh, uh, make everybody happy, meaning having a, a triple win uh, outcome. So that's all from me and thank you very much. Thank you very much Andres. I'm sure you'd be happy to take a couple of questions. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much, very interesting. I wondered if you have been able to use your modelling and methodologies to help decide whether that week or Heathrow should have the extra runway. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, very interesting question, of course. Very topical as well. Uh, in my opinion, we, we should have a, a third uh, runway in uh, uh, in London. Uh, as you know, the Airport Commission uh, did come up with uh, 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 the possible uh, establishment of a third runway uh, at Heathrow Airport. Of course, there, there are different uh, issues to, to consider. Uh, from an airport perspective that operates at full capacity like uh, uh, Heathrow, obviously having a third runway uh, may uh, prove good news. Of course, uh, you need to consider the other uh, business stakeholders here. But uh, uh, it's evident, in my opinion, that uh, if London wants to uh, uh, you know, uh, keep its uh, dominant position in uh, uh, the European market and in the international market, uh, further uh, investment is needed. Uh, in my opinion, it's not so much whether investment is needed, but who is going to finance the investment and how we can properly deal with uh, any possible negative uh, environmental externality. So that again brings the whole issue into consideration. Thank you. Two questions, really. The, f the first question is, um, do you have some examples of destinations where we've actually seen this, this triple win? Yeah? And um, following on from that, uh, there's a lot of assumption here on aviation being the force for transformation. And I wonder whether there's been any research done that perhaps compares uh, the relative impacts of aviation compared to things like high-speed rail now, and whether or not high-speed rail is actually a, a more powerful force for regional transformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Uh, now, re regarding the first question, uh, what I described here, I, I don't regard it as uh, uh, rocket science. I more regard it as common sense. Having said that, uh, there are few, very few examples, if any, where such relationships have involved. So, uh, a couple of years ago, when I was uh, still in Greece, the uh, region of South Aegean, which uh, is in control of uh, uh, some uh, very big uh, and famous destinations that you might know in Greece, like Mykonos or Santorini. Uh, uh, they commissioned us to undertake a study very much related to that. But even you know, in the context of this study, they didn't provide us with, with uh, proper data. We did ask for contractual agreements between uh, the various locals, carriers and the authorities. They didn't want to uh, provide us with uh, uh, these agreements they regarded as a commercial secret, although we were the ones to, to provide solutions to them. So, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, uh, anybody has, has worked in, in, in that area. 
Usually it's extremely difficult to get hold of uh, these agreements. They are uh, in many cases secret agreements and they are not revealed. But uh, the problem here is that uh, they might be uh, uh, liable to uh, uh, legal uh, uh, issues. So as I said earlier, many of the agreements that are signed by tourism authorities in Europe with airports or uh, the, um, um, airlines end up being found as uh, uh, areas of indirect subsidies by the European Commission. So uh, if you go to the side of the European Commission you will find plenty of cases where the Commission decided to intervene. Uh, they found out what all these uh, 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 indirect subsidies uh, were illegal and asked uh, local cost airlines to pay money back. So uh, uh, to uh, answer your question, uh, this is a conceptual model. I think it can work very well. Uh, having worked for uh, the region of South Aegean, uh, I'm not convinced that uh, this is the way that things are done in practice. I'm not surprised about that because uh, usually uh, people just uh, don't have a systemic approach but uh, have a more uh, a short term approach. Uh, in any case, I believe that it would make sense to move according to, to this plan. Now, coming to your second question about uh, uh, high speed railway, uh, again, uh, quite important, but uh, two elements to consider here. The first one is geography. Huh? So, when we talk about islands, by definition, you can't expect them uh, to uh, link them with a uh, high speed railway. Uh, second thing, it's a matter of distance. So a uh, high-speed railway might work very well for distances, let's say, up to uh, six or seven hundred miles. If you talk about uh, longer distances, it becomes quite uh, different. And also, it's uh, an infrastructure element because until today, a uh, high-speed railway infrastructure has been primarily uh, um, funded by uh, public sources. This is gradually uh, changing, but um, uh, it's still the dominant case in Europe. Uh, for airports, it's slightly different because uh, increasingly, uh, you know, the uh, private sector is is getting involved. And in any case, uh, a railway is uh, much infrastructure heavier compared to uh, um, many airports. Okay, thank you. It can, but usually uh, from a short-term perspective. So, you know, terrorism and tourism, uh, obviously, uh, it's, it's quite critical to consider the, the effect of terrorism on tourism, but uh, a number of studies and uh, long-term data have shown that uh, the impact of a terrorist attack is usually short-term, but in the medium to long-term, a destination is usually able to recover. So definitely we need to uh, consider security here and embed it as an additional cost to be shared by all involved stakeholders. But uh, as I said earlier, usually the impact of terrorism is uh, in the short term. In the medium to longer term, uh, business is back to usual and uh, keeps growing. Andreas, forgive me if I misunderstood, but I understood that um, the real focus here with the airlines was on the low cost carrier very much. I was just wondering, do you see a future for legacy airlines and developing tourism destinations, or is, are, are they practically cut out of it because of their cost structures? Well, as you rightly said, it's, it's a matter of cost structure. So, uh, been, uh, 15 years ago, uh, it was clear who was doing what. So, 15 years ago, a low cost carrier had a very different uh, you know, cost configuration and behavior compared to a network carrier and a charter line. But gradually, everybody started uh, blending the business model uh, in order to survive in the marketplace. So if you look at the short haul uh, uh, market in Europe at present, network carriers, in many cases, they replicate some of the practices used by low-cost carriers and vice versa. And charter carriers were the original low-cost carriers anyway. And in many cases, low-cost carriers started as uh, charter carriers uh, operating on a seasonal basis uh, instead of an all-year-round basis, which uh, is the case elsewhere. So uh, 
Uh, to answer your question, I think that uh, uh, legacy carriers are there to stay. It's uh, just a matter of uh, uh, the business model they use. And uh, if they actually take the uh, network advantage uh, uh, into uh, uh, account, they might actually uh, be in a competitive edge. So if you have, let's say, British Airways uh, flying from uh, uh, JFK in New York to London Heathrow, which is obviously a long-haul flight, and then uh, have an online agreement to uh, take tourists down to Santorini, uh, then that would obviously be a great effect because uh, you would have uh, British Airways bringing American tourists to Santorini, which at present only Norwegian can do in in context of uh, low-cost carriers. So network carriers are there. They should capitalize on operating both long-haul and short-haul. But again, it's a matter of economics and having the appropriate cost structure for the short-haul element of the flight. Just going to take one final, one final question. Thank you, Andreas. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the use of your model for developing countries. Can it ever be a triple win for these countries, particularly given the amount of powers that the big airlines have on these nations? It can, but may, it may prove even more challenging huh? because, uh, uh, remember, all, all these models do depend on, on governance and how efficient governance is. So in many developing countries, uh, you need to consider all these risks associated with uh, uh, poor governance at different levels. So I think the model is there, reality is there as well, so we need to consider uh, uh, the, the, the added complexities, let's say. But uh, I think it could work, but it would be much more difficult.